Is everybody in? Is everybody in? The show is about to begin. Cheering crowd sound It's concerts Concerts that made us Concerts that made us Dot com <sighs> Craig Vittorio You're very welcome to Concerts that made us Thank you Now Sarina released Your single Borrowed Time On February 9th Take us a bit deeper into it Share all the details Oh man well, um, Borrowed Time is probably one of the older songs that uh, has existed with this iteration of the band. Uh, the band has been through sort of multiple phases with different members uh, in different locations as I've moved um, from place to place. And uh, so now um, in the last four years, basically since right before COVID, it's been myself, Mark Aish on guitar. Uh, Mike Forsyth on bass and <clears throat> Robert Abrams on drums. And uh, we found Rob uh, in an audition like two days before COVID. Oh, lovely. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we, we hired him and then all of a sudden the world shut, shut down and we didn't have a rehearsal again for about eight months. Oh, God. <laughs> um, but yeah, Bard Time... Uh, was sort of a demo that uh, existed uh, that I showed to Mark right when I was starting this instance of the band. And um, it was a very rough, like didn't, it was, didn't sound anything like, you know, where we're at now. Um, and I was like, well, I'm going to take, you know, I want to get this stuff rehearsed and, and ready to go so that we can into the studio and record an album. Um again covid um so as soon as that happened um i kind of shot that plan down um at least with the whole band and uh but my producer uh nick belmore um he he's a very professional drummer he's played in a lot of bands he's he's currently playing drums in uh in many eyes um uh uh with his brother charlie um it's uh, uh keith buckley's new band the old singer from every time i die mm. so they're 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 the guitar and drummer uh for that new band and but nick has been a producer and engineer uh, running a studio out of, out of uh his place in connecticut for years um and uh so i'm he was like my go-to um uh, when i started putting these new songs together and uh and he helped me flesh them out um a bit more and when it came time to track them uh, I played basically everything except for the drums and, you know, he did the session drums for him, um, you know, and then he would fly them back to me and I would uh, cut vocals at my place. I would do guitar dubs at, at my place. Um, I would cut a lot of Mark's vocals remotely. Um, and yeah, so like that, that, was and once that track came back once it was printed like the, the, that was this that was the song that was like okay this is the idea for what the rest of this album is going to be basically you know this it kind of set the theme and um a few songs had been written basically in tandem with that and a few were um covid uh products <laughs> and um you know and I, it went from being like what was supposed to be maybe a two or three or four song ep to being a full LP with um, it's like 45 minutes long now. Yeah. Yeah. Our, our times kind of set the stage for that. Right. Right. And the LP is dropping on March 15th. It's also being released on vinyl as well. Am I right? It's, it is actually, I have, I have it, the, the vinyls in the box behind me. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so March 15th was the date. We're actually having to push it back by a week. So it'll be coming out uh, a week from March 15th. It looks like, um, 
the 22nd, I believe. Uh, it's just because of the way our scheduling worked with distribution and, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, right. But but we're planning on uh, an album release show out here in Brooklyn um, on the 20th. It was supposed to be at St. Vitus, which I don't know if you... No, I'm no. Not, not familiar, no. No, all right. So in in the northeast part of the states in in the heavy metal and music uh heavy metal and rock scene um saint vitus is like a pretty renowned place it's like a kind of a stomping grounds for harder bands to you know get in and it's like it's like kind of a the place it's it's one of the clubs that everyone tries to get into at least once and we were supposed to do our album release there and it got shut down because the it's got a gripe with the city right now well, lovely. <laughs> so we we found another venue. It's going to be at TVI on on March twentieth. Mm. You know what I'm picking up is you seem like a band that from the start everything was stacked against you. You know when you try to do something, everything goes wrong. How do you keep pushing forward? Um, it's it's a good question. Um, you know I've got a lot of really good support. Um, like my bandmates are very supportive of me kind of taking the direction with this project. Um, and my wife is very supportive of, you know, me sort of seeing where I can take this. Um, and, you know, I've, I've been, just been a musician my whole life. So it's, it's just in my bones at this point. You know, if it wasn't going to be Zarina, it would have been something else, you know? Mm. Yeah, yeah, I get you, I get you. And where's your happy place when you think of the band? How far, obviously, you know, every band wants to make it to the top, but where's your happy yeah. place? Uh, my happy place? Well, um, I think for right now, in the next year, couple of years, you know, we'd like to see ourselves getting on some bigger bills with, you know, as a supporting act you know, re for realistic acts that are kind of within our genre and, um, you know, and getting into like the festival circuit and, um, you know, hopefully making our, our way out, you know, towards you uh, in, in Europe and um, getting in the festival circuit out there. I think that, that would be, that would be uh, kind of like a short to um, shorter timeline goal for us. And, you know, it's taken nearly two years for this record to be released. You know, that's a long journey when you think of records. How does it feel mm -hmm. that you're finally at the end of it? And what does it mean for the band now? Well, I got to a point where with this record where, you know, it wasn't released yet, but we were playing uh, somewhat frequently and we were playing all the songs on the album and I was getting, starting to get fed up with them, starting to get tired of it. And uh, then my wife got pregnant and, um, and we had our kid and we spent a lot of, um, we spent a lot of 2023 sort of rehearsing here and there, but, you know, I was more just focusing on working and being a dad and we played one gig last year. Um, oh, man. Yeah, just you know, that's how it is. Like you know, you're we're parents, and and we don't we have any help. <laughs> you know, we, our parents don't live anywhere near us, and we don't hire help. Or it's just the two of us, and um, so you know, we focus. We spent the majority of last year focusing on on just being there for for our little boy. Um, but now that he's getting he's a little over a year and he's starting to not need so much in terms of um, being up four times a night for a bottle feeding. <laughs> <laughs> I can, I can get back to focusing on, on doing more writing. And it's actually where I, I landed towards the end of last year. I, I started um, putting together demos for what I think is going to be this next EP or maybe even an album. We'll see how it turns out. Uh -huh. Nice, nice. And, you know, the podcast is called Concerts That Made Us, so I need to ask you some concert-related questions. First yeah. off, as a concert goer, what concerts have made you? 
Oh man. Um, well, I'd be remiss if, if I didn't mention my very first massive show, uh, when I was 12, 11 or 12, um, my parents took me and my best friend to go see Slipknot, uh, System of Down and, and Rammstein. Oh man. <laughs> All Yeah, in one that show. was, it was the, that was the first, yeah, that was, it was like one of the last times Rammstein was allowed in, in the States before they got banned. <laughs> um, and it, man, it was, it was wild. And I was like, oh, this is, this is just unbelievable. Um, and like, that's like, I'm definitely a, a child of the generation of like where new metal was massive and, um, I loved it. And then I kind of hated it. And now like the world seems to be weirdly loving new metal again. Yeah. Yeah. It's Um, coming back around. so, so I've been, I've been having fun kind of diving back into some old records that I haven't listened to in literally 25 years. <laughs> um, um, what else? What are the, uh, when Ozfest was a thing that was, that was big. Um, we used to, my, my friends and I would, would make it a point to go, Uh, every year if we could um concerts that made us so big the biggest one in my mind though is is for sure uh when i saw soundgarden um before like a year a couple years before uh, chris died yeah um i went with a buddy of mine and nick uh belmore the drummer producer on, on our album Uh, because one of the reasons he and I jive so well is because of our similar love for Soundgarden. <laughs> and um, so it was at this theater in Connecticut and it it was like no openers. It was just two hours of Soundgarden. Oh man. And it was amazing. Like, you know, you, and then you show up and you're like, oh, Chris has been playing these songs for 30 years at this point. He's not going to be able to sing the way he used to. He sang just as good as he used to. Oh. It sounded amazing and and man like watching him do that was unbelievable yeah yeah especially yeah. now since we don't have the chance to see him anymore as well makes it even more special yeah. so i on the uh on the album uh we did a sound garden cover um we did uh pretty news um sort of our Zarinified version of it, uh, which is like you know down tuned, and um, just you know a little bit sludgier, <laughs> but it's um, it's it's a version of of that song specifically because that is the the Soundgarden tune that like it's one of the that's one of the songs that like made me want to be a musician. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I gotcha, I gotcha. Bit of an odd one now. Is there a concert you've attended that, say, fans of your music would be surprised by? Um, I don't know if there's anything specific. Like, outside of, like, the bands that we sound like, I go to see as much jazz in and around the, the New York City area as I possibly can. Um, like that's outside of like writing for this band, my other musical interest has always just been playing, a, playing guitar and, you know, more specifically, uh, like jazz and rock. Um, so I, that's, that's where I'm usually finding myself if I'm not like going to some like heavy metal you know, crazy hardcore show where people are getting thrown around in a mosh pit. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. And when you think of your sound and everything, how has your local scene influenced it or impacted, do you think? Um, there are a lot of bands specifically in, you know, in, in our part of Brooklyn, specifically in the building that we rehearse in um, that are just, unbelievable like they and and they all are unique and doing something that's truly their own and uh you know everyone's got like um everyone has influences but you know you listen to some of these acts that are coming out uh, of this part of the city and and they're just 
jaw dropping good, you know, uh, with not just with like the, the, the songwriting, but like the performance and this way that they sort of carry themselves as, as bands, like, you know, there, there's like a real community around it, um, which is probably more influential to how we act as a band uh, more so than its influence on the songwriting in and of itself. The songwriting in and of itself is just me being locked in this room for hours and days on end sometimes and getting ideas as, out of my head with uh, as best as I can articulate them. Um, but other than that, I mean, it's, it's really just about being a part of this larger group of, of bands that we love to play with. Right. Right. Speaking of playing, the point we're all waiting for for any listeners that haven't seen one of your shows lay it all out first um it well it depends where you see us i mean sometimes <laughs> the shows could be you know 25 minutes long if we have a quick set sometimes it could be closer to an hour um depending on where we land on the bill and if it's our bill and um what we really are trying to convey that night um you know, it's it's fun to like go on stage and and wank for an hour, for sure. <laughs> but that gets old to an audience goer um, pretty quickly, uh, especially if you're like a band that no one's ever heard of, and and you have a much more lasting impression on any audience, whether they're your audience or not. If you can just go on, do your thing for twenty five or thirty minutes, and get off, and just be so tight it's just like have the tightest 30 minutes of the band that you could possibly have and that is just the will make all the difference in the world yeah yeah true true and when you think of all the gigs you've played is there one that sticks out as the highlight um Uh, with this band, it was, we played a, a venue called the Knitting Factory, which was a, a big venue in, in Brooklyn for, you know, many, many years. And it finally shut down, um, about a year and a half ago, maybe. Um, and we played the, the sort of going away show for that. We played one of the going away shows for that, which was really nice we played to you know a pretty pretty sizable audience on on like a sunday night which was unexpected and um it was just it was awesome because that was like a place where like one of the reasons i came to the city was because of hearing about the some of the shows and like legendary venues like knitting factory or st vitus or a lot of the places around you know manhattan um yeah so that that was that was nice Right. I like it. I like it. Now, if we take that question and flip it around, you can use any gig you've ever played. Now, I'll, I'll be fair. Is there yeah. one that's the worst? And how did you overcome it? Uh, yeah. Um, and this has nothing to do with the venue uh, or the people that ran it, because the people that ran it were, were super professional and, and really lovely. But we, we toured um, in spring of 2022 uh, and did a show at a place called Polly's Hotel up in Albany, New York. Um, and we played to like four people and um, and like a, a, at, a, at a place where like where our type of music didn't seem like it was very appreciated. Right. <laughs> and um you know, I just, I was like, all right, well, this is, um, this is not where I want to be when, when I'm like, this is not the headspace I want to be in. Like, so obviously we're going to have bad nights like this, you know, and I should be prepared for it. Um, so, you know, I tried to just play the set as I would play it anywhere else. And, uh, then when we came home that night, we we came back down to Brooklyn and, and played a, another venue down here that was uh, much more our speed and 
you know, the, the crowd that knows us around here came out and, and, um, and we're very welcoming. So it was a good, nice. good way to sort of dismantle that <laughs> shitty headspace. That was in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And when it comes to show time, then what's your pre-show and post-show? How do you psych yourself up? And then afterwards, how do you wind down? Um, how do I psych myself up? Um, well, the guys and I make it a habit to go find a turkey sandwich somewhere right. before a show. Um, after a show, um, I will just, you know, I try and get myself off stage and, and packed up as quickly as possible so that I can just not worry about my gear <laughs> right. um, because there's a lot of it. And, um, and just like get to enjoying the other bands and, and being sort of more in that headspace where I can be a supportive audience member um, and, you know, run our merch booth if we need to. And, and um, that's, that's my post show is like just unwinding as an audience member as best as I can. Yeah. Yeah. Say you Saturday night, you play the best gig ever. You know, yeah. couldn't go any better. You wake up Sunday morning, it's kind of back to reality. How do you kind mm -hmm. of deal with that? Um, you know, I, I don't really think about it. Um, I, I guess I've just never thought about it in a way that it's super critical. Right. Um, like I, I would go play a show one night and then wake up the next morning and be a dad and I just think about being a dad when I'm when I'm doing that, you know. I like it. I like um, it. Yeah, yeah. Th there's definitely like, um, there's definitely like a, two worlds I live in. There's like my 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 day job, um, professional world, home life, and then there's my life as a musician, yeah. and they're they're definitely two separate things. Um, and as much as they can be hmm. right right what's one thing you would change about being a musician then, if you could um <clears throat> i think i would just every i think every musician would would always love to have a time machine to go back and um kind of weed out bad habits you know um like if I could like take what I, if I knew then what I know now sort of situation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it would be that. All right. Makes sense. Makes sense. Before we dive into the last couple of questions, then future plans, we've heard about the album release show. Anything else mm -hmm. you want to want to share with us? Uh, album release, uh, March 22nd, uh, the release show. Um, is March 20th. Um, it's going to be available uh, digitally and on vinyl. Um, by the time the show rolls around, our web store will be open. So um, we should be able to fulfill shipments for anyone who wants to pre-order it or order it after it's available. And um, yeah, keep, keep an eye out because we're definitely going to have more um, tour dates coming up uh, probably in midsummer and into the fall. Brilliant. 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 It's just worth the release. Great, great. Where's the the best place if people want to pre-order the vinyl or it would be on our website, uh Zarinaband uh dot com. Brilliant. The web store isn't live yet, but it will be very shortly. Cool, cool. We'll uh we'll dive into the last couple. So these are a couple of random fun questions, but I'm in, intrigued to see your answers. First off, sure. what are you currently obsessed with? It can be anything at all. Oh, right now, um, my current obsession was was building the the studio that we work out of. Um, so in this building, um, there's it's an old factory that was turned into a music building. It's, it's all of these monthly rehearsals re rehearsal spaces, um, and all of my you know pr production and recording gear was at home. Um, because I didn't have a kid at the time, so I didn't need to bring it here. <laughs> um, but like 
we had the kid and, and I was like, I got to get all this stuff out of the house. I know. And I want to bring it here where, you know, I actually do music and can like work on it. But the room that we're in was just, it just needed so much work. So I completely dismantled it. I took all the gear out. I ripped the floor up. Um, I fixed all the walls and um, put new flooring down, bought new carpets, made a bunch of panels for the room um, for acoustic treatment. Um, and then started getting the gear back in here and, and miking it up. And um, now it's a, uh, now this is, this is just where this is like my creating this like little sanctuary, this is like my quiet little happy place. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Yeah. The next one. So if you had to spend 24 hours locked in a room with any musician from history, who would it be? Um, Hmm. that's a good question i don't know how long would i have to be locked in a place with them 24 hours i don't know if i want to be locked up with anyone for 24 hours <laughs> <laughs> whether they're a famous musician that i adore or not um I guess maybe like Grant Green or Joe Pass. I would just have them drill guitar lessons for me for uh, 24 hours. <laughs> not bad, not bad. Yeah. And the final one. So what is your go-to album? Um, My go-to album mm. uh, is Jeff Buckley, uh, Grace. Oh, yeah. Right, right. It's I like have said that that's like, that's the uh, that's like that's like an album that I remember where I was when I heard, first heard it. I remember what I was doing and what I stopped doing because I was listening. Like it, I was I was in Manhattan. Uh, I was like a freshman in college, um, and I was walking down the street to go to the train. And the singer from the band that I was in at the time uh, gave me uh, gave me um, a CD, like because like, it was a, it was still you know we were still listening to CDs on CD players, you know? yeah, yeah. And um, and I popped it in, and I was just like, "Holy shit, this is what is this?" I mean, I like stopped walk. I stopped what I was doing yeah. to like listen to it. And, um, and I like listened to it the whole way through and then I went home and I listened to it again. And I've since gone down this crazy rabbit hole of Jeff Buckley. I mean, this was, you know, 18 years ago at this point, you know? Yeah. Um, but I had gone down this crazy rabbit hole of, of finding everything Jeff Buckley that I could find because he just did that one album and then sort of demoed a second album and then he died. Mm -hmm. And but there's just all this material that he just recorded live stuff, interviews, um, alternate takes. There's just so much like it's there was just so much work that this guy did. Um, and it was just so inspiring to me. Um, but yeah, like it, that, that, like Grace by Jeff Buckley. This, yeah, one album I can listen to from front to back any day of the week, anytime, no matter what mood I'm in. Great choice. Great choice. Listen, Craig, it's been an absolute blast now. Thanks a million. Yeah, thank you. Welcome to the podcast. Contents that made us. Interviews and stories. Tales from the bus. We love taking you back to when it all went down. The greatest live shows and that cheering crowd sound It's concerts, concerts that made us Concertsthatmadeus.com Concerts that made us, concerts that made us.